So in the case of, of uh, the progressive side of the spectrum, um, they have a heavy burden. They have to account to the people of the country why it was more important to have separate party identities than to come together the way the right did with the Canadian Alliance and uh, the Reform Party. And if they did that, we wouldn't be talking about this tonight. But they didn't do it, and they have a lot to answer for. So here's the bottom of it. If it comes down to the progressive side ends up with 60 to 70 percent of the vote, under no circumstances should any of the players, and I included that, the Bloc Québécois, the Green Party, the Liberals, and the NDP, under any circumstances should anybody form an alliance with Stephen Harper. And I would predict that if anybody dared to do that, including the Liberals, if they dared to do that, then I would say, take a look at what happened to Nick Clegg in the UK. He tried to get in bed with somebody who was his ideological opposite number and said he would keep them honest. Instead, he was swallowed alive. And what happened in the next election? 12% of the vote for the Liberals. And that would be the end of the Liberal Party if they ever got in bed with Stephen Harper. Thomas Mulcair said he wouldn't do it. Elizabeth May said she wouldn't do it. The blocky big was he wouldn't work with anybody but Harper. So that leaves it on Justin Trudeau to come out and say, we will not under any circumstances support the government of uh, Stephen Harper. My view is we better start making things again in North America. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have prosperity without making something. And I put it to you this way, would you rather be the guy who eats all the apples or would you rather be the guy who owns all the orchards? Because right now, the Chinese own all the orchards and we're the market of last resort. We're the buyers of last resort. They want us to give up our, our well-paying jobs and our social benefits and they want us to buy the products at inflated prices and they want the corporations to reap the difference. And that's one of the things that I think somebody's got to come up and say there's something wrong with the notion that the cars have got to be made there and sold into our market. My goodness, I don't know enough people who have high enough paying jobs to support that anymore. And I think one of the things people have got to stand up for is something being made of value in this country, not shipping out 500 pound cot blocks to the Boston market so they can do all the added value down in the States, not taking crude oil and sending it down to the Gulf Coast, where all the value added is added on. This country, for over 100 years, has been sending all of this treasure to other people for a song, and we've got to get out of that mindset and start making something of our resources in this country. <laughs> Harper Lit is growing as a genre. <laughs> <laughs> about Stephen Harper. I have said nothing in public about uh, the other books, but I was talking tonight to one of the people here, and I said, um, you know, Paul Wells' book, uh, which won the Shaughnessy Medal, uh, was um, described as impeccably researched, and yet the book had not a single word of the biggest story of 2013, which is robocalls. There was not a single mention of robocalls in that book. Um, we have another book by Globe and Mail uh, columnist John Ibbotson, uh, time to come out just before the election and to try to paint the Prime Minister as a kind of an august figure. Um, I don't think he is, and I think that does what a lot of people have been doing with Stephen Harper in the mainstream media, which is um, veering away from calling a spade a spade. Now, yes, it may hurt your access. Yes, it may make you unpopular cocktail parties, but that's not why we do what we do. And I think it is one of those things. Um, it is always necessary to tell the truth, but it's most necessary when it is dangerous to do so. I think that the whole issue of immigration uh, is, is just uh, full of political manipulation. Everybody wants to bring the immigrants groups in but also to remind them who brought them in. And I've seen it with every political party that's ever been in power. It's an important thing. Um, one of the things I think cannot, they cannot happen is we cannot start saying to the world, send us your brightest and best, and the ones, your doctors, yeah. your professional people, yeah. we'll just leech those out of your society, yeah. and then you keep all of those people that are going to be a social cause. This country used to be built on realizing that ordinary people, if they got a chance to unleash some potential, would take it. 
and they would do a great deal with it, right? Look at the 50,000 most people who came in 1979 and what happened there. It's a, it's a marvelous success story. And they weren't all doctors and lawyers, and they didn't have piles of money in the bank to prove that they were bringing something to the country. It used to be what they brought to the country was the human potential. And that's what I think the policy should be based on. Their needs, I think we shouldn't turn our backs on refugees. I think there's a huge difference between immigration and refugees. This government is treating refugees like they're migrants, like they're some sort of a disease. 1,012 people, a promise of 10,000, never delivered. We did it 50,000 boat people in 1979 with Ron Adkey as the immigration minister and Joe Clark as the prime minister. They took the view it was worth it, and I think it's been proven that it was worth it. And what we're doing now is disgraceful. Yeah. The apocalyptic white tribe. Well, I guess because the consequences of doing nothing is more of the same. That's essentially why you keep on trying. I seem doomed always to begin again. I finish one book and say never again. And then soon, I'm at it again. And I think that the battle it is worth it. Because if you don't stop people like Stephen Harper, if you don't show them you can't lie to us egregiously and have no consequences, then what you will do is turn lying into the norm. And then everybody will start to think that's how you do this. They'll copy the successful politician. They'll start doing his speaking lines, which some of them are already doing. So my view is, no matter how hard it is, even if there's just one or two of us, and we know we're right on something, you have to stand up to him. And the argument that they have all the power forgets the fact they're the temporary custodians of the power. The power resides in the people, and if the people get engaged, now let's face it, it's a pretty sad statistic. You realize that more people check the Facebook page than voted in the last election on a daily basis. Yeah. It's very sad, 61% was all we got in the last election. Many more people than that checked their Facebook page. And we have to show as much interest in our society as we do in ourselves, or else we're going to, there's a great saying, if you don't take an interest in politics, politics will take an interest in you. And this guy is the living proof. Right, so our next question, which is very simple, is this the road to fascism? <laughs> the classic definition of fascism is when there is no practical difference between business and government. I ask you, are we there? There is no practical difference between business and government. Who does Stephen Harper meet with on a regular basis? Remember when Chief Teresa Spence wanted a meeting? One meeting. She didn't get the meeting. And he made a big show of not getting the meeting. And the next day he met with 10 female business leaders in the PMO. Stephen Harper speaks to one group, and that is the group that represents the business elite. And I'll tell you something about the business elite that no one should forget. We've lived through uh, a virtual hurricane of corruption in the corporate world. If you go back to Ken Lay, you go back to the Enron Corporation, Dennis Kozlowski, and all these people who stole and lied and cheated in Anderson Accounting, the corporations have nothing to hold their heads up over. And for someone to make the corporations the model of what we should be following, you know, what we should be following in society would be like making the carpetbaggers out of the Civil War the model of what the South should have done. It's completely ridiculous. Who are the people on Harper's team that influence policy and decisions? Or is he the sole source for government direction? The person is asking you know, specifically uh, Jenny Byrne. Jenny Byrne and Ray Novak have worked for the Prime Minister since they were teenagers. They are robots. The reason they have value to him is they are extensions of Stephen Harper. The last thing Stephen Harper wants from anybody is independent advice. I spoke of, uh, for the uh, book with Garth Turner. And Garth Turner was called up on the carpet because he expressed an opinion in his blog. And Stephen Harper said, you know, Garth, I had something for you, but the last thing I need is a media star and a big one. So you're not getting anything. And the way Harper operates with people, Preston Manning said, Stephen's great problem is he thinks he's the only smart person in the room. Dimitri Suda said, we don't do polling. We have Stephen Harper. We have the belly button poll of the Prime Minister. That's all we need. And he makes all the decisions. The unfollows of Stephen Harper is the font of all wisdom with these people. And no one dares to say anything 
because Stephen Harper or something in Georgia said to me, is the person who gives out things. So if you want to have a chauffeur-driven car or get $15,000 added on as a parliamentary secretary, you do what Stephen Harper wants. The people who oppose Stephen Harper are the ones who, uh, by a short route, find their way out of the Conservative Party. So the answer, essentially, to that question is uh, there is no inner circle with Stephen Harper. There's just a dot, and that's him. Most of this question has been answered, but I think I can get a different question out of it uh, and get the same point. Uh, what do you feel would be a more truthful and accountable um, form of, elect of electing a government, and how do we hold our governments more accountable? Well, one thing I would like to see with people is um, <laughs> to turn away from um, the idiocracy that television is turning us into. Um, the programs that are just meaningless, garbage, steady diets of trivia and diversion, and get people interested in an old-fashioned thing called substance. I would like to see people read more or demand more out of uh, the people they watch on television and current affairs than they're getting now. I would like to see them put pressure on uh, news agencies and television stations to give us something <coughs> community content that is excellent instead of derivative. And we get so many programs that are just pale copies of the nonsense that's going on in the United States. And by the way, I think the whole Donald Trump phenomenon can be laid at the feet of the idiocracy that we have built, built with the dumbing down of our population and the disengagement that we have sown with our, with our kids and young people in the political process. If there's one thing I could change, because sitting out in this debate, how do we get the young people involved? Yes. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, they do their banking with their cell phones. They call their friends, they text each other, they Instagram each other on their phones. They do everything on their phones. Yeah. We've got to build a system where they are comfortable and we are secure that it cannot be corrupted. And then you're going to see them do it. I go and speak at high schools and even universities, and one of the things I'm told is, we don't know literally how to vote. I know that sounds lame, but I've heard that over and over again. I don't know how to vote. I would if I knew how. But if we could, if we could devise a system where the kids could work on the thing they love the most in this world, which is their, which is their cell phone, I think we could engage huge numbers of those nine million millennials who don't vote. He wouldn't want their vote. He doesn't want to hear from young people. No, he doesn't want to because 80% of them won't vote well, for him. Absolutely not. Uh, Let's actually talking with young people uh, who came out tonight. And also the question, how do you feel about strategic voting? If the choice is between more harbor and voters showing intelligence and voting strategically, then I choose strategic voting. If I, could have my, if I could have my perfect world, the progressives would have gotten together after the last debacle in 2011. After, I mean, let's face it, 2006, 2008, 2011, the conservatives cheated in every single election. Yeah. The in and out scandal was stolen in the last week of the campaign with an extra million dollars they were not entitled to, and what was their penalty? A $52,000 fine. <laughs> So the way I look at that, that's pretty cheap. They net out about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars, even giving some other money they had to return for cheating in the election, and the margins were very small. Now here's my great hope for this election: that there is so much uh, information out there, if people will make the smallest effort to get it, that I'm thinking we're going to go up between four and five percent in the vote, and Stephen Harper will be wiped out. What happened in Alberta happened because the vote went from 60% to 69%, a nine point increase. And that changed the face of the province after 13 consecutive conservative majorities. If we were ever on the federal scene to go from 60% to 70%, yes. Stephen Harper would be deeply forgotten in Oakland. Yeah.